first question is to, uh, the first thing is to kind of have you folks share with uh, me and the audience, um, what was the kind of the motivation um, and the timing of getting into uh, the green space? I would like to think that um, as a product development firm, uh, at least that's how we started, we are now a design and innovation consultancy, um, but have our roots firmly in product development. So when you're designing new products, you're pretty much rooted in consumption and making desirable things that people want. Um, that's a tricky proposition because you're basically creating landfill no matter which way you slice it, right? And you'll design these products that might last 10, 20 years, but then they ultimately end up as landfill. And uh, if you go back to Victor Papanak, who uh, wrote an interesting book called Design for the Real World, his, um, his mantra was, the best thing that designers can do is stop designing, which... Uh, obviously that's not going to happen. Um, so we still took that to heart. And so since in the 30 years, I guess, that we've been in business, I think we've been paying some attention to that. Um, it's only become uh, very focused on a couple of particular uh, moments, sort of some knife-in-the-gut moments. Uh, one was during a uh, plug-in air freshener, which you know we evaluated uh, in terms of uh, – it's projected sales, you know, scale, bringing it to scale, tens of millions of units out in the world. Um, and I remember talking with uh, some of the manufacturing folks and him turning to me and saying, yep, we just put two new power plants on the grid for this one little device. That is in and of itself kind of innocuous, but in tens of millions, it adds quite a load to the already stressed out grid. Another one was um, – uh, toothbrush, the swoopy toothbrushes. Does anyone remember that we used to have sticks with bristles on the ends? And then we came in and designed this swoopy toothbrush with an elastomer overmold. And um, now the toothbrush industry has changed. And Thomas Overton, who uh, designed that toothbrush, had an interesting experience. Uh, one of his friends was walking on a beach and found one washed up on shore and brought it back to him in a little baggie and, if, and showed it to him. And if you could capture a moment where you can see the soul just kind of get kicked out of someone, um, that was it. He was very proud of this uh, design that he had made, obviously had tremendous impact, but then it also had some negative consequences as well. So 2004, that's, uh, we had a lot of these incidents like this. We brought in our first hire. Um, who was focused exclusively on the environment. That was uh, my colleague, Bob Adams. Um, I came at it from a different direction, just working on a bunch of projects uh, that I brought my own values to around environmental sustainability and have since joined Bob in sort of leading this domain forward. And let's see, uh, I guess in 2004 you could say it officially got explicitly started, but we've been, we've been well-informed and uh, sensitive to the topic. For some time. Um, for Clorox, I think it was kind of explicitly started to become part of the corporate strategy back when our new CEO started, uh, Don Knaus, about a year and a half ago. And he started focusing the company on four megatrends, and sustainability is one of those megatrends. And since he became CEO, the company's bought Burt's, Burt's Bees and Natural Personal Care launched uh, Greenworks, the brand, back in January 2008. And then also our Brita brand has started focusing on um, reducing waste from <laughs> bottled water <laughs> by using more filtered water. Um, and then in addition to that, we had some scientists working on a natural cleaning formulation as kind of a side passion project for about five years before then. And about a year and a half before the Greenworks launch, there were some technological breakthroughs that allowed greater efficacy from natural ingredients. And so combined with a co greater consumer interest around green products with the CEO, that kind of created the perfect atmosphere for um, launching kind of green revenue generating items for Clorox. And then in addition to that, we've established um, an eco office in the company that's evaluating our carbon footprint and then ways that we can do to improve that over time. Um, and they're evaluating things like adding solar panels to some of our factories as kind of large scale measures, but also um, replacing the company cars that our sales folks get for with, they used, used to get like kind of Ford SUVs and now they're getting Priuses, so that's a nice improvement. And they're doing also kind of little things like making sure that the printers in the general office print on double-sided versus single-sided. So variety of stuff going on at the company. 
So Method was founded in 2000, um, and it was founded actually with an explicit mission to bring green to the masses. So it was founded by two roommates in San Francisco, Eric Ryan and Adam Lowry. Um, Eric was the design guy. He has an advertising background, and Adam actually is from Stanford, and he has an engineering background. He's kind of the formulation guy. And the two of them, while they were roommates, beyond having an extremely messy house, um, they really talked a lot about what are the... Um, kind of what's the white space out there that we see? And Eric had noticed in, through a lot of work with his clients in the cleaning space that the cleaning category was really ready for revolution and for change. Um, everything kind of looked the same. It was a sea of sameness, as he likes to say. And he had, having a design background, really wanted to bring something in, bring that emotion that consumers have about their home into the home cleaning category with design. Um, and he partnered with Adam, who um, had been a, glean, a green cleaning consumer for a long time, but had been frustrated that to use green cleaning products at the time, you had to give up. You had to sacrifice, basically, either efficacy or kind of um, experience, if you will, with the product and scent and what have you. And so Eric and Adam came together to kind of bridge um, and create Method's overall mission, which is about bridging style and substance, bringing the two together um, to create the products that we have. Um, as a result, they've created an organization where green is at the core. It impacts everything we do. We don't talk about it as much as um, maybe, um, you know, Seventh Generation does or other other green cleaning products companies. It's really something that we wanted to do strategically was to attract mass consumers in with our design. So a target consumer, they see our beautiful dish bottle, they'll buy it, take it home, leave it out, and then as they read the back panel, learn more about the company via the website, they'll start to learn about how green the ingredients are, as well as start to learn about the method story and the company and our values. And it's kind of this um, analogy of a relationship, creating a relationship with a consumer and they fall in love with you as they kind of undress you, if you will. Um, so that's, and that actually kind of also goes to a reason why there's two of us on the panel, um, besides uh, Laura being good enough to have both of us. Thank you. Um, and it's because I'm in the marketing side. I manage our laundry business um, and Drummond's in our greenskeeping group. And um, I'll let him talk a little bit about how, how your role works and how it's core to what we do. Yeah. So first, can everybody hear me speaking without a mic? Very, very bad at speaking with mics. So um, let my voice carry. Um, I, uh, I work in a group that uh, I guess that was, it was started out of the personal interest of one of the co-founders. So Adam Lowry is a chemical engineer, went to school here, and worked initially, um, worked initially on climate policy, which is like about as dead a field as you can imagine. Um, worked on modeling data of, uh, I guess, air mixing um, of emissions from North America into the world. So very important stuff, and it was actually worked with um, a lot of the IPCC members who then got a Nobel Prize. I think Adam feels a little robbed that he didn't get his Nobel Prize, but um, he, uh, I think, was, was getting very frustrated with the slow movement um, of this policy work as an agent of change and saw starting a business as this opportunity to drive change really quickly. You know, you could get a, mar you could get a product to market um, in, you know, a comparatively very small amount of time that would give people very actionable ways to make changes in, you know, the, the, gro the, the, the gross environmental footprint of their lifestyle and do it in a very easy way. Um, and do it in a fun way. I mean, this is, you know, this is starting a business rather than, um, you know, looking at mixing data for CO2 over in the airways over North America. So it's a fun, actionable, quick way. And this is a way to define an organization to enact that change um, rather than trying to write a ship, you know, that was, you know, that was, I guess, that it had embedded behaviors that were, you know, totally contrary to that mission, you know, that were just makers of, um, of stuff that, created more to the landfill problem rather than, I guess, addressing elements of the solution of, you know, um, uh, well, the materials and all the products around us. So, so it's kind of interesting um, uh, that all of you say that all that this initiative was began with uh, a vision coming from the top. Yeah. Right. I mean, for you, Steve, it was your own values coming onto the table. Um, so what, one thing I'd like to get at is, especially for Method and Clorox, and I'll get to you, Steve, in terms of the design part of it, is um, how did you go about, because clearly there was a trend line, but it was not, when, when this was started off, you said 2000, and you're talking about 2004, I mean, green was not mentioned as much. I mean, if you just look at media mentions, green was not there. Uh, how did you go about uh, targeting consumers? Which consumers did you target? Uh, which retail outlets did you target to begin with so that you kind of could get the traction and move on to, you know, the mainstream market? So, so initially, um, 
it, it does go back to kind of Method's initial launch strategy when they launched the brand. Again, it was about trying to really shake up the cleaning category and um, kind of get into that white space there. What Eric, and it goes back to their mission, what their mission was was to create, um, to use business as a change agent basically, and they wanted to get mass consumers to be using greener products. So we actually initially wanted to go after a very mass target, so um, we looked at what customer you should sell through and went after a relationship with Target, um, which we end eventually ended up getting, and that's been really the crux of our business um, for quite a long time. We have a deep relationship with them. Our whole approach has really been for that mass consumer walking down the uh, cleaning aisle at Target or now in other retailers that we're in is to, again, attract her with the design and the look of the packaging and then follow up with the green messaging. So in 2000, it was really just about creating the space and bringing change um, to a category that actually wasn't asking for it. Consumers weren't asking for it at the time. It was really more the vision of Adam and Eric that they wanted to bring it in. And I thought um, it was a really unique way to go about it. They didn't want to actually go to the natural channel to start, um, to launch the brand. They explicitly wanted to go after the mass channel because they really wanted their business to be an agent of change. And now, obviously, times have changed, and green is a big trend, and which is great. And it's you know in the news um, every day. Um, and so now, obviously, we'll talk about this later, but obviously now we're facing different sort of business dynamics and challenges just to communicate our green authentically in a sea of um, a lot of competition. Yeah, I got one quick add to that is from, um, from an initially from an external perspective, I've been at Method for about two years and worked in green product development with a couple different companies beforehand um, from a consulting firm. What was neat about Method is they were one of the companies that was attacking that assumption that green products really uh, implied a sacrifice, that there was going to be a compromise. So I think if you look at that kind of earlier period of you know, the 2000, 2004, a lot of green products had a very easy association to a lack of efficacy, be it in cleaning products, be it in uh, apparel, be it in you know, consumer product goods. I think my favorite example is uh, I used a PLA spoon. It's polylactic acid. It's a compostable cutlery or a compostable polymer. I used that, uh, some cutlery made from that a while ago that if you put it into... Um, hot soup, uh, the, the spoon actually became so flexible you couldn't get the soup out because it would just droop down and <laughs> fall. So it was, it was a really you know, nice environmental product that was useless. Um, I think Method did a really good job in the cleaning products category, or it was one of the companies that did a good job of attacking this assumption that green could not do the job where you needed hazardous functional chemistry. So kind of created the market to which they can, or that they can serve now. And then for, at Clorox, um, we had done a cleaning consumer segmentation that identified a consumer segment called that we call the chemical avoiding naturalists. And, uh, and so these were folks that were using traditional cleaners today, but they were learning more and more about the choices, that green choices that they're, they wanted to start making in their lives. But they kind of took to these points, like they, didn't, they couldn't make those choices yet because there were too many trade-offs. And so the, the natural products available to them just were not fitting the bill and not meeting their needs. And so the Greenworks line was developed to make sure that we were meeting the needs of that consumer. Um, and it was really developed around four key principles. One was work as well as traditional cleaners. And so in our technical testing, we actually have parity uh, results in terms of all the kind of traditional number one products that we compete against. Second is available where she shops, and so we made sure that they were, we were available in all the different customers that we work with, so Target and Walmart and Costco and all those folks. Um, and then third, it was that the pricing was not going to be too premium versus traditional products, so we try to make sure our pricing is like 20 to 25% premium traditional products, but not as expensive as, say, a Mrs. Myers that's like a 130% premium, say. And then lastly, um, from a brand name she trusts, we learned that the Clorox name on the, lo on the package really um, gave a lot of assurance to the consumer that it really was going to work, that she wasn't going to be disappointed again. All the different times that she had tried different products that hadn't worked, this time really was going to be okay. And so um, that's really what we've built a business on going since then. I have a quick follow-up. And so... In terms of method, right off the uh, start, it was it was focused on the green space. Clorox then shifted, right? It entered into the green space. Um, did you have situations where consumers would come and say, "You've gotten green now," which means that the products that, that you have other lines which are yet to become green, uh, why don't you accelerate the process and so on? I mean, do you face uh, these questions from your customers, your consumers, not the, not the customers? 
I mean, definitely. And I think the thing is that people want different things. There's, you know, right now our products don't disinfect, and there's a, a significant portion of the consumer population that want disinfecting cleaning products. And so we, th we still have to have that trade-off. And we're, we're working on trying to find natural ingredients that really work that also disinfect, but it's something that, you know, you need to kind of have off both today. You know, there's definitely, <laughs> price is, is inherent in like every choice the consumer makes, right? And um, that's one of the reasons why we made sure that the price was not going to be so much higher than the rest, than the traditional products that are out there. But we also feel like the benefit natural ingredients gives the consumer outweighs the price premium. And so she knows that it's, it's kind of like buying organic produce. So personally, I buy organic produce for my son and I get this normal stuff for myself <laughs> just because like the price premium is so different and, and this consumer is making the same choice she's buying the more expensive stuff for her family in the way in the places that are most important to her and so she's a lot more price insensitive in that way because she's feeling doing what she feels is right for her family to make her family as safe and natural as, po as it possibly can be so the price value equation is always going to be there but it's definitely modified by the benefit that natural ingredients gives I think I, I agree with that. I think anytime you talk to a consumer, depending on who they are psychographically or socioeconomically, their price is going to come up. It just yeah. depends where on the spectrum it's going to come up. So, you know, our uh, our consumer um, talking to them, price is a huge issue, especially <laughs> right now. And we're and we have premium. We're premium priced about. 20, 25%, depending on which category you look at. Again, we're not as high as a Mrs. Myers. But um, what we look at is really, it's not just about our price point, it's the value that we're driving to the consumer. And as Emmy said earlier, there's different consumer groups out there who care about different things in different ways. Um, so really, who you're appealing to, um, they're deriving value, or who we're appealing to, they're deriving value from the whole host of things that go into a method product or a Greenworks product. So we're appealing to someone who really wants that beautiful design and to have something that they're proud of on their countertop, but also feels good inside that they know that they're taking care of their home as well as they're taking care of themselves and their family through using these, these products. So it's that derived value that you get. Yeah. People will always put their personal needs before the needs of the planet, right? As much as you hope that they would go out of their way, I mean, there's certainly a, a green niche out there that will do the exact opposite, but it's only a niche, and you risk kind of getting into this, this green ghetto, right, which both of these companies seem to have very strategically avoided. Like, they're getting to the mass market. They're doing – they're bringing the message to more than just the, the, the believers, right? Um, so – if, if, if it's the personal needs that always come first, yes, cost is a great driver, but probably because um, so much of what has been out there for so long is competing on cost, right? I mean, if cost is the only channel, of course cost is going to matter. But now I think people are starting to wake up to the sense of, you know, I want to be a better parent. Uh, I want to be cool. I want to be sophisticated. These are products that start to address some of these personal values that, Yes, cost is one of them, but there are there are many others as well. If I'm going to spend money on a cleaning product, I might as well put it where my values are and spend yeah. it on something that's good for the planet. And, and just to follow up on that, we have some uh, data, and I'm sure the members of the panel can add to this one, suggesting that for uh, many consumers out there, uh, green has become a hygiene factor. You know about hygiene and motivational theories, right? It's a minimum that is required. Otherwise, the product doesn't even appear in the purchase funnel. They just kind of completely get it out of their consideration set. Uh, and we're beginning to see that happening. So in other words, it is a minimum that needs to be taken care of, and then you follow that up with price and competing on other benefits and, and so on, like design of the packaging, um, stuff like that. I, I don't know if you... If you... Sorry, I guess just to add to that, I think what we've seen in, in our um, kind of face of consumers is that what well, we were originally focused, as I mentioned, on these chemical-avoiding naturalists, what we're seeing now is that basically it has become a cost of entry to a broader and broader consumer segment. So the different kind of names that we had for consumers before are becoming more interested in natural products just generally. And so I think that that's right, that for people are just becoming more chemical-concerned, basically. And so it's part of their purchase funnel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Certainly, yeah. I mean... Being, 
it's it's kind of hard to compare because when when we go out and do research in the world, we're not necessarily looking at at segmentation so much. We have the I would say the luxury of not having to pay attention to segmentation too strongly. Um, we're just going out to find latent and blatant needs. What are the needs that people need from, say, cleaning <laughs> products or energy or um, transport, whatever the case might be, and really ad address those. And I, I think that's what some of these companies have, have really hit on, is really these deep-seated personal needs that are out there that also happen to have a green streak to them. And I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at packaging, packaging materials. First of all, I love that some of these talking packaging acronyms um, <laughs> really personally happy. Um, uh, so um, this is a great example of where the infrastructure is really setting the pace. Um, there are you know, very few commonly recycled resins um, in most, uh, most municipal recycling facilities in the U.S. And that, like, that basically is the barrier to use of other materials. I mean, there is... Um, there are certainly some challenges in expanding the use of PLA in, um, in you know, liquids and bottles. There are a number of technical obstacles, but, you know, a lack of recyclability um, is a barrier, well, for PLA, which, you know, is a theoretically recyclable material as well as being compostable. Um, and, you know, for other newer uh, feedstocks as well, kind of the, the infrastructure you have to work with is the ability of the facilities to identify not only that it's, you know, one of those two plastic types, but, you know, which stream for it to go into. So what we've done basically is, uh, is try to blow out all of the advantages you can get from those two resins with this existing infrastructure. And so where that's gone is this is actually, this bottle here is 100% recycled plastic, which is, which is actually, uh, which, which, is, which is pretty amazing that a bottle is this clear and it still gives the colors this much pop given that it's completely recycled plastic. And this is the product of a number of years of work. This is actually, this, this material and this being delivered, you know, in 100% recycled plastic is kind of a very, it's a, it's a snapshot of a methods environmental strategy generally is, you know, find these areas where you can deliver a really great product that does serve that, you know, that ever broadening <laughs> but still environmentally or still not primarily environmentally motivated consumer deliver them the thing they're looking for, which is a really cool looking bottle with colors that pop that they can put in their sink and not have to worry about it and maybe um, impress their, you know, trend-setting uh, neighbors when they come over and use their hand soap. Um, <laughs> could happen. Um, so, uh, but, but to, you know, to maintain that, uh, the consumer uh, product experience, but then to be able to embed this, you know, this, you know, the sustainability advantage. In this case, the sustainability advantage is about, I mean, this is, it's, there is no virgin material that goes into the bottle. So it's, you know, a whole lot. It's not ending up with the toothbrushes um, uh, on the beach. Uh, and it's also, you know, it, it's, it's about 60% less energy that goes into turning this into a bottle than if you were to use virgin material. So you get nice double win and it fits in, you know, your existing consumer product category. People don't have to change their behaviors. They just stick it in their sink. They may not even care. That's probably a lot of people don't even care if it's green or not. But it still has the same advantage as the person who bought it primarily because it was a recycled plastic bottle. And that also maybe, maybe that would happen for, you know, a couple of people. Yeah, just, just a quick thought. Related question, and we'll get to other members of the audience here. <clears throat> we talked about price. Um, all this is going to increase costs. In, in, in general, I mean, focusing on the green space I mean, entails certain costs. Um, how does that play into both internally within the organization as well as externally? I mean, externally in the terms of your customers, there's the retailers out there who are kind of trying to squeeze the you know, firms. So how does, how, how does this play out within the organization? And I, I mean, this will be relevant for you as well, Steve, because when you kind of try to have green or greenness in, your, in the product you design, uh, it is going to incur, you're going to incur certain costs. Uh, so, I mean, how do you, how does that play out internally as well as externally with, uh, with the trade-offs that you make, really? Odd part product portfolio at Method, and, you know, some product categories' margins are higher than other product categories' margins. And as a private company, and one that we really try to hold true to our vision always and our values, we make trade-offs based on cost and the products that we launch just to get something out because we feel like it's the right thing to do for the consumer and for the planet frankly. And I, I really enjoyed that ability to be able to um, look at things as a whole pro as a whole company, a whole product portfolio, and make those trade-offs because, 
you know, it's, for example, we we're just launching, um, we've launched some wipes, uh, cleaning wipes that are um, of a bamboo st substrate, and the bamboo market has kind of gone crazy, and we've talked a lot internally about what do we do about that, and the conversations, I think, have been extremely frank. We get a lot of pushback from our sales field folks and our VP of sales on, you know, is the consumer really getting um, the value here, and it, it's created a lot of great internal debate. And um, you know, we've been able to hold true to our values and make decisions based on that. Obviously, you know, you have to make trade-offs, though. But it's something that comes in, you know, a, way, a weighing of how much do we want to go on that substance end and be true versus how much are we going to make in profit. That seems to be a bigger problem at Clorox, right? I mean, the, the thing about it, you have all the traditional lines, and then you want to bring in the green into that mix, and then you have resistance from the sales force, and so. How is this? How does this play out in Clorox? Well, again, it's trade-offs. I mean, you have to. You know, we have kind of internal margin targets that we're needing to make, and the formulations are made so that we can hit those targets and still hit our 99% natural requirement that we have across our products. Um, and we just enter into supplier agreements that allow that to happen. And and uh, we haven't been able to get kind of as far as you guys have been on your packaging kind of recyclability. I think we're only like 25% recyclable in our packaging, but I think it's because of the trade-offs that we have as a, as a um, public company. And we're, we have projects going on to try to address that, but it's kind of one of those things you need to make sure that you're still giving the return for the investor that the company requires. I'd kind of like to challenge the notion that it always means more cost or that it will always cost more to do green. So I brought this uh, prop here. I don't know if you guys have seen this. You seen these new milk jugs that they just put out here? This is something that um, recently came to my store in my neighborhood, but uh, was initially released in the southeast. And this is a gallon milk jug and a hundred million dollar effort to redesign the gallon milk jug. Now, this actually saves the consumer about ten cents per gallon of milk. Okay, and the sustainable story or the uh, green story about it is uh, old milk jugs, if you remember those. Um, they had to be packed in crates. They had to be shipped individually. It's costs. It's widely inefficient to distribute. Or, um, um, yeah, in the supply chain, there's just so many inefficiencies with that old milk jug. This takes advantage of those inefficiencies, makes it stackable. They palletize really easily. You can fit more in a refrigerator, and you get more shelf space out of them. Um, and therefore, you have fewer trucks cooling just open air, and you have more cooling milk. Um, saves all kinds of energy and costs in the supply chain, right? And that pretty much paid for the tooling and everything to get the milk jugs there. Now, where is the cost incurred? Well, if you go and read about this milk jug release in the New York Times story, you'll find that um, what it does is it actually makes people forget or feel like they've forgotten how to pour milk. So <laughs> the old milk jug had the spout right in the center. So when you pour, it actually has to go up and over a lip before it comes out and you have more control this is right at the bottom, so when you pour it, it comes gushing out really quickly and floods your cereal bowl and everything else all around you. So now people feel stupid, and that's a really, that's an awful experience, right? So now the equation where it used to be you can save 10 cents buying this gallon of milk is, do I want to spend 10 more cents to get a gallon of milk that actually works, right? So I'm making all these bottom line cost savings, great, but now I'm sacrificing this, this top line growth because of that. So if you just look at, if you look at green like any other business proposition, there's a supply side and there's a demand side. This obviously meets all the supply side requirements. Um, the demand side is much to be desired. actually recently in terms of their, their, they were doing a pretty broad scale assessment of their car carbon footprint and they found actually the greatest impact that they are making is actually in the water that goes into the product. Uh, and um, so what they've done to start addressing that is start working with Greenpeace and trying to help kind of impact the water sources that go into making Coca-Cola and that's kind of, so they're making choices depending upon where the full kind of sustainability impact of their product is, but I think, and I think they're probably going to try to make some PR hay with that choice, but I, I, I'm, so I'm not sure, I think ultimately you don't want the consumer to be making a, a usage trade-off that is going to make them choose Pepsi versus you, I think, <laughs> in the end of the day. 
to continue on that a little bit, I guess the question is, are there brands for which sustainability is not a relevant attribute? That was the most jargon-laden sentence I've ever said. That sounded kind of <laughs> like somebody. Did that sound kind of like a marketing sentence? <laughs> so is, so that, that for me, for me, that sounded like um, a lot of marketing speak. Uh, uh, but you know, there there are some areas where that really is like it totally causes a hiccup. You know, there are a lot of brands that I'll look at that are now like um, touting relevant or supposedly relevant green attributes, and it's like no, but that's you know, it's a total non-starter. Um, you know, you're looking. I mean. I don't know if you guys know, but in, in, in Norway, automobile companies can't even make environmental claims anymore because their abuses were so rampant. And it was this, you know, like, okay, come on, like, get back to the start of what you're doing here. This is not an environmental product. Like, you can, there's no way to spin this. This is deceptive no matter what you do. I think there are product categories that look like that, um, well, everywhere in the world, um, North America as well. But I think, I mean, cleaning products conventionally was a very good example of a category where you could not make an honest environmental claim until you remade them and they look completely different at a completely different materials and you start re-examining, you know, from a ground up rather than a process of attrition, how would you make a cleaning product that's made out of inherently green materials? And then it becomes, then, then that, then those attributes of, you know, of green or sustainability or, or, or natural or whatever become relevant to that category. And I think there, you know, there are a lot of categories that will go through that process of maturation. Um, but I mean, you know, well, yeah, transportation's a big one. Energy generation. I mean, there are some there are some interesting leads, but I mean, to see P and G, P G and E marketing on environmental benefits again, you know, a bit of a non-starter. It's a bit of a hiccup for is this a, rele a relevant benefit? You know, I think just to kind of go to a, a different level with the with the two questions, if you don't mind. When I think about mature brands, I think you have to be really careful. Um, you're really putting your authenticity on the line if you make changes just to play in the green space. We've seen a ton of greenwashing, and consumers are onto it, and I think that actually hurts your equity more than helps it, for sure. Um, I think Drummond talked about kind of re-looking at the category, and I think the most authentic way to make a green statement is to really change things, or do it because it's the right thing to do, and you don't talk about it necessarily. Um, so it really, I think, it comes back to the hard conversations that you have internally and the decisions and the choices that you're making and the trade-offs you make. And I think, um, you know, just because you do something internally in your organization doesn't mean that you have to talk about it. Maybe you'll get some positive buzz in some way. But I think it has, you have to always be thinking as how it's going to ladder up to your overall equity and how consistent it's going to be with your equity as a brand overall before you make the decision to actually talk about it. Yeah, just to build upon that, I think, I think the... I think in the past, I think this is changing, there was kind of a combative relationship between mature brands and then the environmental kind of organizations out there that made companies nervous to talk about what they were doing. Um, another story is that, you know, Levi's started buying 2% of their cotton, organic cotton, and they started just mixing that into their overall, like, cotton stream, right? But they wouldn't talk about it because they started being worried that people would ask, well, what about the other 98%? Why aren't you buying 100% organic cotton? And there was, like, not enough organic cotton in the world at that point <laughs> to um, be able to make the jeans that, you know, Levi's was making. But it's this kind of dance that you have to do as a, as a mature brand that allows you to be making the right decisions for your overall company and making decisions that are right for you and your kind of corporate values, but also right for the equity and what, and the, what people want from the brand, I think. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a question of what is the what's the credible intersection of your brand and green, right? right. And you kind of have to decide what that is, and then whether you want to be explicit or implicit about it, whether you really want to come out and talk about it or let let it be discovered, let it kind of carry itself. Let me share some of my thoughts on this one. Uh, your focus is on the consumer and on what attributes they care about, what they don't care about, and so on. We are seeing a lot more pressure that is coming from retailers. I mean, in the CPG space, they'll be called the customers. Uh, Walmart, I know, uh, I'm sure Target also does this. They have green audits by which they kind of have different firms that are going to be supplying through uh, Walmart will be told that, listen, you'll have to kind of reduce your footprint in, in terms of you know, the carbon and so on. Um, and so some of these initiatives that are going on within organizations uh, is occurring Partly for, you know, feeling good itself, the leaders itself feel that this is the right way to go. Uh, partly coming from consumers where it matters. And this is where, uh, when you talked about, you know, in certain categories it really matters, sustainability. But I think it's the major push is coming from 
uh, the retailers. I know for a fact I was sitting uh, last summer at Tesco, their office in the United Kingdom, and it's very clear that they're moving in that direction in a big, big, big way. I mean, they just lay the line down and say, I forget about it. I want to see the same kind of price reductions we've been forcing you to, to do over a period of time. We're wanting you to, forcing you to go green, <coughs> green as well. Uh, so they, it may not be visible for the consumer. And if Tesco then supplies somebody that business? Tesco is just saying we are a responsible retailer. That's the kind of the image that they want to kind of promote. Actually, so the laundry category, I don't know how many of you have been out to buy laundry detergent recently, but the laundry category has gone through compaction. So it went from a, um, kind of highly water intensive um, liquid detergent down to 2X. So they basically have the water content. We actually launched, not to toot our own horn, but in 2004, we launched the first triple concentrated laundry detergent, basically because we wanted to take the water that's unnecessary out of the bottle. You take dosing down, um, you basically save on transportation costs. It's a great environmental play. We launched, obviously we were at Target, Tide, or sorry, all small and mighty followed um, two years later and um, with their 3X and then totally blew it out at Walmart. Um, they had, they were a VPI item um, at Walmart, which is uh, just a, a, an item that people and um, kind of buyers at Walmart and folks that work in the store are really going to get behind, kind of put it on shelves, merchandise the heck out of things so it really sells. Walmart saw laundry compaction as a great way to make a change, um, and they actually um, basically ended up strong-arming the whole industry by getting P Procter & Gamble, P&G, to compact their laundry detergent. Um, P&G has an over 50% market share of the category. Um, Tide is almost most of that. And so by Walmart actually seeing kind of the right thing to do on an environmental level, forcing, frankly, um, its suppliers to move towards this compaction, they were able to provide great change for the environment. And now the whole laundry category has completely changed. It's basically a 2X um, concentrated category with just a few 3X players such as us. And um, Walmart has gotten positive press about this, but this has been mostly a, pre a PR play for them. Um, and so that's kind of just an example of where customers really do give you the pressure and they're necessary. That pressure is necessary sometimes to create change. I think but actually I think that laundry example, sorry, um, very yeah. quick add on that is the laundry example is a perfect one of where, you know, Steve was saying, oh, yeah, this is not a trade off. The environmental benefit there, I think that's been such a durable one and such a widely embraced one because, I mean, there is a very clear environmental benefit to avoiding shipping around, you know, an extra gallon of water. Um, I mean, you know, the shipping space, uh, the amount of real estate you take up uh, in store, the amount of packaging, the amount of water itself, all legitimate environmental benefits. I think why it was embraced so strongly, though, is you now have, you know, you've got maybe twice as many facings of the product on shelf, so you can turn more stuff over for the amount of real estate and retail. Um, you're not paying to move that around. It makes a lot of sense for the retailer as well. Um, so, I mean, it was one where they got, you know, some, they got the sustainability points, you know, like an example of leading the charge environmentally. But it was a more favorable business case. And I guess that's the real job is, and I think it was really interesting, the two brand managers reported, you know, that, that, um, that green attributes are really a question of balance, of how many can you bring in. And the whole back end, the whole product development process is avoid, avoid compromise, avoid sacrifice, avoid like trying to balance these and get them to the brand managers at the point when you've already figured out how much you can possibly do without trading anything off. You know, getting them to the table when they're in like, you know, uh, you know, where, where there is no inherent having to, okay, cool, we'll do as much of this as we can, but we can't really afford too much more in that format. Try to get it to the table um, uh, in, you know, to the table in, in you know, in a, in a product council or two, like to the brand manager in a format that's not going to imply that sacrifice. And then it's up to them to take as much as they possibly can within the margins. But the whole back end is like, the whole back end is uh, really explicitly avoiding those compromises. Oh. I would just say I just think that the the laundry story is, is for Walmart is it kind of goes back to like what the, your brand stands for because this is all in line with Walmart's like live better save money and so they were able to kind of make hay off the fact that they were forcing companies to save money for them and they, so they could pass that along to the consumer and so it, it again it kind of fit in terms of like an intersection of green and like what was right for them as a corporation and they've also expanded that into packaging too so they have now a packaging scorecard that all companies that are distributed in Walmart have to meet those requirements too and they're asking you to improve kind of your packaging attributes getting lighter less um, less kind of 
extraneous packaging in shipping and all that kind of stuff. So they're continuing to force costs out of the system that has a green benefit, but also lives within their equity. You know, this method bottle, um, the first triple compacted detergent, people saw not because it was green or it may have saved them pennies. I think a lot of people just saw, it, I'm not going to break my arm carrying this to the car. Um, I'm going to be able to put this in my dorm room and carry it down to the laundromat. I mean, just simple things like that, all these benefits that, you know, compaction gives you that don't necessarily have to be green. And that's kind of how we need to position, or at least at Ideal, that's what we try to position green as this method or way of getting to these uh, deeper needs or desires that people really want met. Um, again, like the personal needs will always come first, so how do we tap into those? Um, for the cost savings, though, I mean, um, it's interesting because this bottle seems like because it's triple compacted, it, there may be a, it may not be such, it seems like every error you make, like every little drop that you spill is actually three times the drop you would have spilled with the normal bottle, right? Mm -hmm. And the stuff is three times as concentrated, so there's some stuff there. I don't know. I mean, this is the first step. Maybe there's a next step where the dosing is taken care of for you, and you get to throw in something. You don't, you don't uh, waste any of that, I guess. There used to be differences before. I know, I mean, if you look at the data, there used to be differences. I mean, you could clearly see that the East Coast and the West Coast and, and the smile, the classic smile, you'll see this consciousness going. But you don't see those differences now. At least that's the data uh, that's telling us. I mean, look at target sale of method. I mean, I'm sure if you look at the scanner data, you don't see too many, too many differences now. And the development of green ones, it, like nationwide, is the same as the development of the Clorox's traditional products. People tend to be different, I think, in California than, say, where my brother lives in the middle of Texas, right? Like, he has, he has three kids and four businesses. He doesn't have time to read bottles. He doesn't want to be an energy manager or a products manager. He doesn't want to know anything about the soap other than it cleans, right? <laughs> he does care about things in general, but he needs to meet those, those personal needs first. If you're trying to bring something like policy into a marketing message is 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 very difficult. I mean, policy is there to help foster a relationship between the companies and then the government in which they operate, right? But for the marketing message, I think it's really trying to align the company's goals with people's personal goals. And that's how that's how you build a relationship that these guys have done so successfully. I think a good example is the whole Sun Chips ad campaign where they were like, these are made from the sun in one of our factories. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, it, it, and so, there's a site called like greenwashing.com that rates different greenwashing claims, and they got called out for that on that site. And so, it you, you still have to provide the right information and in the way that consumers care. And so, you need to make the choices in in what natural products you offer that are delivering the benefits that they care about, about the most and, and not inviting more questions than you're able to really answer. If you need an educational campaign to communicate the value of your green offer, that to me is, that to me is a sure sign of design failure. Like you've, if you failed to connect with people if you need to have some very rigorous, yeah, absolutely sort of educational campaign. At Method, design is obviously give, very core to what we do, and we have a very. I've, I've, you know, I worked at Clorox and kind of was got used to the process that um, that a lot of large CPG companies use, and came to Method, and was excited and very surprised at how we kind of mix things up basically. So we have in-house designers at, that um, are core to the team, core to the cross-functional team on any innovation product. And it actually really starts with them and um, the marketing manager, and which is 
what I am, and our green chef, which is our formulator. And kind of the three of us together really do just this unprocessed sort of brainstorm and discussion around what are really the key consumer needs and functional as well as aesthetic as well as um, formulation that are in the category. And that's kind of where our ideas come from. Um, from then on, um, really all players are involved in the process of making sure that we are refining the product um, and the communication and the formulation and the design such that it's really optimizing the consumer experience. We do a lot of in-home, rough and ready sort of in-home um, testing with consumers to make sure that packaging is ergonomic and functional, you know, easy to carry, um, pours well, you can use with one hand basically and take out the little pill and throw it in your dishwasher. We do a lot of work there just, just to make sure that we're getting everything right. But then we also rely a lot on our gut as well. And we know what we want. We kind of, we're a company that kind of brands, its side, brands itself from the outside or from the inside out. And so we use just our gut a lot and what we would want to see and what we would like to use um, to inform a lot of our decisions as well. So it's a very fluid process, but design, I would say, is at the core of it with the marketing and consumer insights and, the, and what we can do from a Greens perspective. And there we go. Mm. We have like we have this. Uh, our, our, the the, the co-founders are kind of like a really weird married couple. Um, they're both <laughs> actually uh, they're both married to other people, um, but they are like yeah like a very odd couple. One's about five six and a little blonde guy that wears uh, white shoes and looks kind of like Ellen DeGeneres. Um, uh, the other the other one is about is about about six foot six and you know like uh, uh, you know like the perfect all-American young entrepreneur. Actually, they both kind of are, but but uh, but very very like total like total. Uh opposite to, to Eric. Um, and so, I mean, the, kind of the company's ethos and a lot of the, um, a lot of the development decisions really relied on this um, tension between the two of style and of substance of, you know, like, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could make a product that looked like this and serve this different function and then having, you know, the substance end saying, okay, cool, well, these are the materials we could use and this is how we could get there and kind of really relying on them well, honestly, kind of sniping at each other a lot of the time, but really like relying on the tension of them kind of pushing for their respective visions of what a product or a company would look like. And this is really encouraged in a lot of our development process as well, is that we are going to expect to disagree about a lot of things. Um, there will be, you know, like a lot of very heated moments about, yes. you know, in a product development process where you'll have two completely different pictures for how something will look and, you know, like have a lot of respect for, I have a, a lot of respect for my colleagues in their functional domains and very clear about where mine ends and theirs begins and we can... Sometimes. Um, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Except when I start trying to speak like a marketer. Um, but, uh, but yeah, can respect where they're going to know where a decision makes sense and be able to run with those, but really rely on that um, kind of constructive... That almost out. seems like ideal. Right? But this is how you guys work. Yeah, I mean... I'm trying, to, I'm trying to sit here and formulate a succinct answer to this question because <laughs> everything we do is about innovation. But I'm, I'm happy for the question because green is in and of itself an innovation exercise. It's, it's not an easy place to get to because we don't really know based on historical because we haven't been doing anything green for a long time. It's hard to know how to get there, right? So um, I think a lot of the things that were, were mentioned here, it's uh, – the way IDEO approaches it is, is with design thinking is how we describe it. So design thinking is about insights, getting insights not just from business or from cultural trends, but from people, how it is that people are living today. It's integrative. It's not just getting one insight and then designing a solution for it, but integrating all these insights and trying to do something new, find a new way to do something. Um, it's intuitive. It is bringing your own personal point of view to the design problem. If you just integrate insights, you're going to get to some average result. But it is that gut check, and you know your business better than anyone else, so use it and use your intuition to get you into these places. And then most of all, I think it's optimistic. I mean, we've heard a lot of doom and gloom, especially in the credit crunch these days, that uh, everything's going to pot. Um, but optimism is absolutely key. Um, it's not so much seeing optimizing what's currently uh, optimism and optimizing. It's not so much seeing what's already out there and what can you make of all the pieces, you know, you're already stuck in the system, but being optimistic that you can get outside of that and find a new way to grow. Um, I think that's probably the most important aspect to innovation. Amy, you want to have a last word? So um, I guess Clorox probably <laughs> for, uh, is more of a linear process for innovation, I would say. Um, and starting from both kind of taking a consumer need and identifying how we could, you know, fill that consumer need 
And then also the scientists sometimes will be look, working on kind of product formulations. Maybe we could do it this way. Maybe we could do it that way. And, you know, sometimes they meet. Sometimes it doesn't work out. And, uh, and it's – I think we're getting better at taking a more <laughs> instincts-based approach to making decisions. But in the past, I think we were more analytics-heavy, <laughs> I would say. Um, but I, I think in the end, it's, it's about figuring out what the open marketplace – availability is, and then creating a product that fills that market need. Thank you very so. much. So uh, we will be having the networking event out there. One last word for me. I mean, I've been interested in green for some time now, and uh, it's only this year that I offered a week zero course, which hopefully will become a, a week-long course in the fall quarter. And when I offer these new courses, I always am looking for guest speakers. Steve Aldi was a guest speaker of mine, and now I know I have three potential <laughs> guest speakers. So thank you very much. Thank you.